one organization that's been a, a, a good uh, good friend to our organi- to, to the IHC and, a, and an active participant is Eclaris, and we have Dean Mason on the line with us, uh, who's the CEO of Eclaris. Dean, welcome. Hi, thanks for uh, thanks for having me on today. It's good to be back. Uh, just in case anybody in our audience is not fully aware, as they need to be, of Eclaris and what you do, can you just spend a second to uh, enlighten uh, on uh, what Eclaris is doing and maybe what's different from uh, last time anyone may have heard? What's new and, and exciting? Sure. Um, Eclaris is a technology and services provider in the uh, consumer account space um, covering FSAs, HRAs, HSAs primarily, but also ancillary um, types of uh, tax advantage consumer accounts like uh, dependent child care, commuter, hybrid car reimbursement, et cetera. We, we uh, have primarily a small group of you know very large uh, financial institutions and uh, insurance companies um, and uh, other types of organizations that um, private label our platform and services uh, under their own brands. And we were acquired in May by Towers Watson, um, which you were just mentioning, uh, which is the parent of the, the One Exchange platform. We're actually um, now part of the uh, Exchange Solutions Group, which, um, uh, which houses One Exchange inside of Towers Watson. And we um, are, you know, underway in terms of uh, building out an integration into that platform. Great. Um, you know, powerful brand and great reputation. And, you know, just uh, as I as I looked recently at our healthcare consumerism uh, brand study that we've been doing, um, you know, Towers Watson is, is at the top of the uh, – of the um, brand recognition list as a, as a leader in the market. Um, so great, great place for a Claris to be situated. Um, yeah, we're very so, happy to be, a, be on board. You know, fall enrollment is, is not a new thing, obviously. Um, but nope. what, but, but that said, it's hard to talk about our, our, our industry Dean without acknowledging that every day there's something new. And if we were on the, you know, if we were an, exe- an employee benefit executive, it would feel like, you know, a wall of, of change hitting us. So as you think about fall enrollment, what, what do you see being the same or different this year and, and why? Well, I think, um, the, you know, the principal difference that I, I see is this increasing uh, acceleration towards consumer-based um, plans. Um, you know, driven uh, in part by um, really t- uh, two forces. One is absolutely the Cadillac tax, and um, you know these plans um, help people sort of get underneath um, that, particularly an HSA style plan, which has sort of got the longest uh, tail to it right now in terms of being uh, underneath where the Cadillac tax is going to hit. But also by the, as you were just, you guys were just talking about the increasing. Um, uh, acceleration of large employers in particular moving toward their active populations toward private exchanges. And, um, you know, we, we do see, um, uh, we do see that driving um, a much higher rates of adoption of these types of plans than uh, we would otherwise see. And um, I, I would, in fact, I was at your, your Baltimore conference and it was interesting to see uh, folks like John Young and Todd Berkeley, you know, reviewing that trend line and talking about how, you know, their estimates of, you know, 45 million, uh, you know, or, you know, rising to 50 million uh, by 2020 um, as more and more people move into these plans at a much more rapid pace. Mm-hmm. So what, why do you think uh, consumers are, are choosing high deductible plans and HSAs? What, What's triggering that? Well, I think I think there's yeah I really think there's a number of factors. Um, you know, at the level of the individual, uh, people are getting more comfortable with these plans, and understanding that they you know they tend to make sense. And a number of people have said this, and I like it a lot. It's is is healthcare costs go up. Uh, you know, we we call these um, HSA style plans, high deductible health plans. They're really low premium plans, which I think is a more accurate mm. name for them. And people are looking for ways mm. to kind of cap their spend. And as well as their out-of-pocket risk, which is very, uh, you know, which is these plans are a great way to do that. 
Now, um, the other thing, though, particularly in the private exchange world, the uh, the tools, the decision support tools that we see being implemented inside the private exchanges are really helping people to think through uh, the decisions that they need to make and, you know, what's the right plan option for me. And you, you, you haven't historically seen those types of tools rolled out um, in the normal benefit cycle, and they are being rolled out in the private exchanges, and people – because they're actually taking the time to step through that decision process, they're arriving at a decision that actually maps better to their appetite for, uh, you know, pre-tax um, premium out of their paycheck versus out-of-pocket risk um, once they get home, and as well as the total exposure that they're comfortable with um, on a full-year basis. And, and so that, you know, that's turning out to be a very – a virtuous exercise for employees and one that's, you know, both saving employers and employees significant money. Can, can you give us some, uh, you know, beyond anecdotes, are, are, are there some um, examples or facts you can point to that, that prove that out? Uh, you yeah. know, intuitively it makes sense. Um, again, back to that study we've done, we asked uh, our, our audience, you know, what their frustrations are, and 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 they're really around ROI. You know, give show me the show me the data. Um, yeah, that sure, these absolutely. Cool things um, are working. Yeah, I can absolutely uh, speak to that. Uh, you know, first and foremost, on the the value of the decision support tools. Uh, if you if you look at at uh, you know not full replacement HSA style implementations, but where um, an HSA what we call a slice option, where an HSA is paired side by side with a traditional PPO type, type plan. What we what we would typically see is about you know call it anywhere from eight percent to fifteen percent um, of employees would opt into that plan in, into that HSA plan, and mm-hmm. and and this is you know across the last ten years me being at Optum and HSA Bank and out of Claris very consistent kind of adoption patterns, but when you get inside a private exchange environment what you where where the decision support tools are implemented. What you see is um, anywhere from 45 to, you know, high 60, 70 plus percent of the individuals in a slice, same slice type environment selecting into that plan. We even see, um, I, I was at a conference last week where um, the benefits directors from uh, DuPont and Sheraton and a number of other large companies were speaking on stage about their experiences and and they in, in in some cases they offered um, the exact same plans that they had offered the year before, um, and people went overwhelmingly uh, in the same way in, in ways that they hadn't in prior years into these HSA style plans because of the decision hmm. support tool. Another really interesting example was um, one of the directors at that conference who spoke about the. Uh, the, the first year they did it, they didn't really roll out the decision support tools. And what happened mm-hmm. was people went overwhelmingly into their HR, HRA plan. And she said just flat out, we could, we could see instantly that we actually we didn't, um, we didn't drive the adoption we intended to. And so that ended mm-hmm. up costing us a lot more because we didn't get the same kind of uh, attention to benefit utilization and smart shopping um, at the consumer level. Uh, that we wanted to, and the second year they rolled those tools out, and they they ended up saving a lot of money. And so there's a massive financial motivation for them to implement those tools um, that they saw between year one and year two in their uh, exchange environment. Mm, good, good examples. Thank you. Um, talk to us a little bit about the need for our industry to address the convergence of finance, healthcare, and consumerism to. Create a better healthcare consumer. Yeah, um, you know what, what's what's really been interesting for me, particularly joining um, you know post acquisition of Tower, of Eclaris by Towers Watson, is you you look at the way that the private exchanges, which have a very retail and consumerism kind of mindset, are are driving um, you know folks into the right plan choices in ways that we haven't seen before in this industry. And, and then you think about, well, there's these spending, they're, they're choosing these account-based products and there's these spending accounts and we're going to drive downstream. We need all that same decision support now to flow beyond the enrollment experience into the actual consumer uh, spending experience. And what I'm talking about is using, you know, the same types of, uh, you know, analytics of consumer behavior to make smarter choices. So, 
Um, I gave I gave the example at one conference of we actually have the ability to look at the claim flow that's occurring within an account and say, hey, you could have you could have um, you, you know there's a there's a drugstore that's closer to you um, geographically mm -hmm. that has a better price than the one you're paying. Um, that's a real value added moment for a customer and one that engages them in a way that the current technologies out there don't. We've brought historically a traditional, and I come out of the banking world, a very traditional yeah. banking kind of mindset, transaction level mindset to health savings accounts as sort of an asset class. And we really need to think of these more uh, from the consumer's perspective as more of a, a um, how do we advise them to do appropriate spending, not an asset class, but a spending class, um, and help them ultimately save for the long-term goal of um, preserving those dollars towards retirement. And that's in the company's mm -hmm. plans. It's in the individual's plan, best interest um, as well mm -hmm. to for us to provide that. And I think overwhelmingly we're going to see companies that are able to integrate that into um, either – into a robust exchange experience in a consistent way, or just as a standalone offering, the ones that are ultimately the winners. Mm -hmm. um, no, that's uh, you know I, I just uh, I've been was writing down some notes because there, twice so far at least in this conversation where you've shifted my mindset with a with a change of words that I think are really helpful. One was you know let's not think of them as high deductible plans; they're low premium plans. Well, okay, that's an interesting shift that. And change perspective, and you know they're they're not uh, an asset class; they're a spending class. You know those two things together can. Um, I mean, it's interesting the power of words, but those can change the way an organization approaches uh, this whole field. So thank you for that. Uh, very interesting. Um, can you talk about you know the ideal consumer engagement scenario? I, I think part of it maybe was reflected in your last you know example of, of sort of fact based decision making you know that you can help provide but how how can the industry work together to help make that ideal consumer engagement scenario come to life yeah i i think um we we talk about what we 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 think of as you know what's the next generation of the consumer experience and you know you need to look no further than um, you know, if you think of your, your, you know, whatever your favorite airline is and, you know, the app that they have, they do a great job of integrating mm. your, your overall program data with, you know, what's my current today data, like what flights am I going to take yeah. today, right, with, you know, where's all my receipts from everything, right, <laughs> you know, all yeah. in one nice little app and, you, you know, you, it, and so, you know, as I think about the, the, the consumer experience going forward in this industry, it's got to look something a lot more like that. And the advantage that the airlines have is they're a fully integrated, you know, kind of monolith, um, and they're presenting that. But it's absolutely possible for us to leverage um, uh, across this, across the various companies in this industry to enable that same type of experience. And I think, frankly, we're going to have to um, because, uh, you know, who, somebody will get there. And I think it's, it just serves all the players to figure out how do we exchange this information, trade this information, et cetera. But also – to not be, you know, constrained by um, the rules that were invented 30 or 40 years ago. We should be coming up with, you know, what are the best ways possible to do something like substantiation, and what's the best way to have that experience, and 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 then going back to Treasury and saying, hey, we've heard your concerns around making sure that only the appropriate things have tax deferment. You know, here's something that you maybe haven't seen before, but that we think meets your requirements. Uh, and engaging them on, you know, can, you know, will, will this be acceptable? I've, I've, I had an incident uh, six, seven years ago in my career where we ended up doing that, and we got approval to do something from IRS. And I, and I think um, we've, we've grown so accustomed to living in these within the boundaries of these antiquated rules that predated the types of technology and experiences we can deliver today that it's stifling our innovation. And my call to the industry is let's get out, let's innovate, let's come up with the right ways to do it while being mindful of, the concerns that the regulators have, and then come back to them with innovative solutions that are in the best interest of our consumers. Well, Dean, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before we uh, wrap up, do you want to share a few takeaways you want to make sure our audience remembers about Claris, yeah. about what we uh, talked about, all enrollment? Sure. Um, you know, Even though Claris is now part of Towers Watson and we're going to be integrated into one exchange over the course of the next 18 months, um, we're still out selling independently in the marketplace. Um, 
we've got a, a great solution set. We want to be working with people. But more importantly, I would I, my interest is overall in this industry and making sure that we really continue to grow this industry. And one of the best practices that uh, I've been able to identify is, you know, if you're a benefits director, you're listening to this, and you're thinking about driving your folks into a private exchange, or even if you're just implementing a a you know non-private exchange HSA replacement plan, absolutely um, get some decision support tools. You know, get people to step through the decisions about what's right for them versus uh, in terms of risk versus uh, exposure um, versus take-home pay uh, premiums pre-tax being paid. And, um, you know, they will have a better experience and you will get the benefit of better economics overall on your, on your health care spend. And, and that's, that's the best advice I can give today um, to anyone considering this type of health plan. Great. And last thing, best way for people to find out more or get in touch with you? Yeah, you can go to to, um, www.aclaris.com and feel free to write me at dean.mason at aclaris.com. Right, A-C-C-L-A-R-I-S.com. Dean, thanks so much. Have a great weekend.